This is a Toys R Us store in Redwood City, California, but from what you see hanging on the racks here, you think it ought to be called Software R Us. Most of the titles being sold here are for the Commodore 64, one of the original home computers, but there's a lot of life left in that old machine. New software titles still coming out for what is still a very large installed user base. Today, we take a look at an oldie but goodie, the Commodore 64, on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte Magazine, and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and Bix serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chiffe. This is Gary Kildall. And Gary, I'm playing this new game from Spectrum Holobyte called Tetris. The interesting thing about it, it's the first game software sold in the United States written by Russian programmers. But what's really interesting is here's a hot new piece of software. What machine does it come out for first? The good old Commodore 64. This is the model T of personal computers, yet people are still buying them. People are writing new software for it. How come? Well, Stuart, as you know, Jack Trammell had uh, Commodore before he moved over to Atari. Mm -hmm. And Jack's philosophy is to minimize the end user price and just flood the market with the product. He did it with a $10 calculator in the right. mid-70s, remember that one? He did it also with the Commodore 64, uh, less than $200. Yeah. The competition was five times that price. It's just a big, good basic computer for a very affordable price. Uh, the result is there's about, what, 7 million of these mm -hmm. things in the United States alone. It provides a real good hardware bed for software writers because they can take the software development costs and amortize it across mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. millions of units. The result is you get a lot of good software at a very affordable price. Gary, today we're going to focus on the good old Commodore 64. We'll meet lots of C64 users and see the interesting applications they've developed for the computer. Now, one of the reasons the Commodore 64 is still around is it got a new operating system a couple of years ago, something called GEOS. We begin today by visiting the man who wrote GEOS, Brian Doherty, at Berkeley Softworks. The history of personal computers is marked by some spectacular successes and failures. But the award for popularity must go to the Commodore 64, a little 8-bit machine that refuses to die. The 64's commercial success and its enormous user base have inspired some software developers to take a second look at the 64's potential. One of those companies is Berkeley Softworks, next to the university campus in Berkeley, California. What we did is we looked at, at these markets, at the Commodore 64 market first and the Apple II, and basically it, it takes a while for people to really push a machine to its total limits. And one of the things that we really believe in here that the rest of the software world, I think, has only really started to catch on to is using very sophisticated development tools. And the net of all that is we're, we're capable now of developing applications for these machines that I don't think people really thought these machines were capable of, of performing. Berkeley's most important product is the GEOS operating system, a graphic interface for the 64 and 128 that features pull-down menus, icons, and windows. The new operating system opens the door to some very sophisticated applications, like a spreadsheet called GeoCalc, and GeoFile, a database with user-designed forms. There's even a desktop publishing package, something usually requiring big memories and big budgets. But at Berkeley Softworks, it's all in the code. Mainly it's by coding much more efficiently. The I mean, a theorem of computer science is any computer program can be implemented by a one-bit Turing machine. That's actually a, a theory that's been proven in computer science. So even this 8-bit processor is capable of doing all the things that a much more expensive computer, like say a Macintosh or an IBM PC, is capable of doing. Now, it may not be able to do it as fast, although we try to make up for the limitations and the capability of the machine by programming more efficiently. But you can actually do anything with a computer. Joining us in the studio 
studio now is Lucy Morton. Lucy is a member of the Diablo Valley Commodore 64 Users Group, and next to Lucy is Mike Dunsmore, a member of the Commodore Owners of the Peninsula. Gary. Mike, the Commodore uh, Users Group, is they principally C64 users, or what's the composition? Uh, there are some user groups that are just uh, Commodore 64s, mm -hmm. and there might be some that are have a Amiga N64. Now, you communicate through bulletin boards over modems, is that correct? Yeah, there's uh, about two or three bulletin boards, or BBSs I uh, log are, on. Are those bulletin boards run by C64 sometimes, or not? Uh, generally on another machine, mm -hmm. but they might have 64, uh, Commodore 64 um, database and mm -hmm. uh, okay. uh, downloads mm -hmm. of those. Hey, Lucy, um, you, it may be a little presumptuous of me, but uh, you don't appear to be the average game player of uh, uh, using a Commodore 64. Why did you buy a C64? Well, we have always been interested in computers, and uh, my husband also does some programming. And the program is very easy on this machine because you can edit it very easily, and we make mistakes very often. <laughs> so you're primarily programming in BASIC, then? That's huh? right, in okay. BASIC. Now, you have a program that you wrote that uh, helps you make sweaters, is that correct? That, well, it helps me to chart them. The uh -huh. making okay. is something else. Yeah. Okay. Can <laughs> <laughs> you tell us a little bit about it? Yes. Uh, this is an interactive program, and as you run through the program, it asks you what style you would like. Mm -hmm. And you have to have one thing before you start, which is the number of stitches per inch and the number of rows per inch, mm -hmm. which you get from a swatch like this. All right, we've already decided that we're going to make a jacket and that we're going to have a, a knit on band that is knit right in mm -hmm. one with a sweater. And so we're going to have it in ribbing. And now we have to decide if we want a V-neck. I think we'll select a V-neck today. And we're going to put the neck band right in one with the front band, so, so it's a little faster. Leads you through the it leads questions. you through the whole thing. Then, what kind of sleeve do you want? Uh, well, let's take no sleeve for this. So, well, let's have a, a raglan sleeve. Then it asks, do you want long or short? Mm -hmm. And it will go on with this sort of thing. Do you want a fitted sleeve mm -hmm. or straight sleeve? And it goes on through the, all the questions. Then it will program. Yeah, what do you end up with? Show us. Yes, the uh, you, it will do this on the screen also, but it will end up with something like this, which I guess. Is, is mm -hmm. this what you'd like to see? Yeah. Yes. Now this oh, prints really out. Nice. Yes. This prints out all the directions for actually for a sweater very similar to the one that I have on. And the one you're wearing, you designed yes. using your own program. Yes. That's right. That's great. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn to Mike now. If you could yes. slide the computer over to Mike. And Mike, you've been using the C64 to do some kind of artwork. Tell me what you do. Oh uh, yeah, I've made a few uh, pictures, uh, screens. Uh, for for what particular purpose? Uh, well, just to make a picture. Or sometimes I would uh, put them in a It'll be, it would be a title screen for a program I was working on, uh -huh, uh -huh. or for a menu. And you use the C64 plus what else? Uh, Koala Pad. And, and what kind of software? Uh, there's a Koala Pad, uh, the Koala, a Koala Pad Painter. software itself. Yeah. Okay, can you show us some of the things you do with Koala Pad? Uh, sure, let me load this um, okay. Koala Painter in. Okay, I have the menu here. Um, what you would do is you could catalog the disk mm -hmm. from that icon. You could save, get, or name and save, so we can just click on the get. Uh, okay, suppose we want to look at uh, Wacko, say. Okay, so we click on get and go up the Wacko, press the uh, button. Mm -hmm. I already have it loaded. Okay. This is the picture. Okay, that's pretty good. Mm. And that is what? What's, what did you create this for? Uh, this is for a bulletin board that um, I knew the guy that was running it, and he wanted to... The Wacko uh, World yeah, Board. Yeah, the Wacko <laughs> World, yeah. Okay, can you pull up something else you're in the middle of working on? Sure. Just um, go to swap here. Hit that. This is for a program, a menu uh, program. All you would see is the is this screen here, and I could press uh, A, B, C, D, okay. F, G. Suppose you wanted to add some artwork to that screen. Now, how would you do that? Okay. There's a part down at the bottom I'm still working on. Go to zoom here. Put the window down here, and touch up these letters. Mm -hmm. Select a color. Or, so I want to get rid of that green line. I just do it pixel by pixel. Or I could drag mm -hmm. the pointer across. And then you could just paint a graphic in that little space on the right if you wanted to, or yeah. You want to do that, huh? This uh, really it takes it's time consuming. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things is that this is a video composite video, same as your camcorders right. and so right. forth, so you could actually make titles and all sorts mm -hmm. of things for mm -hmm. your home uh, videos. And the interesting thing, I guess, Mike, I mean, you have your sort of graphics design station here for an investment of probably well under $400 compared to some of the expensive systems mm -hmm. we've sure. seen oh, well before. Under that. Okay, Lucy and Mike, thank you very much. As we've seen, users groups have been a very important element of the success of the Commodore 64. We asked Wendy Woods to go visit a users group meeting in Foster City, California, and here's her report.
If you buy for price, you don't always get good service. And that's especially true for Commodore 64 and 128 owners whose low-cost machines get no support from the mass merchandisers who sell them. Enter the Commodore Users Group, like this one in Foster City, California, where people like Ralph Hornbrook try out programs, trade tips, and just plain get the help that they need. It's uh, almost impossible to describe the help. I mean, being in an absolute neophyte three or four years ago, we knew nothing. Where do you go? What do you do? How do you work these things? We knew we wanted to get into it, but we didn't know how to get into it. What we do is we offer a informal hand-holding type meeting where if somebody doesn't understand how to use a computer, we'll sit down with them, show them how to operate it, show them how to uh, do the various uh, processes that are required to run programs, and uh, show them how to put everything together. In other words, just, just how to use their computer and use it to uh, productive advantage. Despite the fact that the more powerful Amiga is now seen at the Commodore Users Group meetings, interest in the C64 is still going strong. The price keeps dropping and people keep buying them, which is why it should come as no surprise that membership in groups like this has actually increased over the years. In Foster City, California, for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. With us in the studio now is Malcolm Lowe with the Commodore West Users Group, and next to Malcolm is Kelly Flock with Electronic Arts. Kelly, Electronic Arts is a, obviously a well-known software producer and game software producer. How important is the Commodore 64 relative to your whole marketing plan? You know, like the Apple, relative to Apple, IBM PC, and so forth. Well, the Commodore is very important. I, I would say that it's our second most important format behind the IBM compatible format. What is it about the Commodore that makes it a good target for a game? Um, it's probably the, the leading home computer with its uh, installed base of like 7 million units and it's uh, very game intensive since as you know we make a lot of entertainment software that's a natural place for us to be. Mm -hmm. And Malcolm, there's, you've got a program in the tract mode here in the background running <laughs> called the Wine Steward. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that program? Yeah, sure. The, the Wine Steward is a program that's designed to help people who are un unfamiliar with purchasing wines to be able to make a, a choice based on the food that they're going to have for dinner. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is written for the 64, and it's used in supermarkets, I understand. That's right? correct, yes. Um, show, show us how you'd use it. Yeah, sure. The, the, uh, the basic screen is um, a menu of uh, choices. You move it down the menu with the, uh, using a white button that's on a cabinet, mm -hmm. and using the green button, you select a further menu. Move down to the choice and select again, and you will be given a choice of... Uh, total of nine wines. Okay, so it's making its decision as to what wines to recommend. And That's correct. And there are three on the first screen, which are budget price wines. The second screen offers you another three at popular price, and the third at mm. premium price wines. How do people like this? The, they, they, seem actually to used? they seem to take mm -hmm. to it very well indeed. Any particular yeah. reason why you wrote it for the Commodore 64? Um, pretty well uh, an easy computer to program for. Mm -hmm. It has lots yeah. of features, particularly color, and you can program different fonts for it. Yeah. Okay, Kelly, let's turn to you, and uh, Electronic Arts has a new game for the 64 called Skate or Die, and I want you to tell me about that. Um, this is a multi-event game where you, it's kind of like a skateboard simulation, where you get to um, do all the things that you wouldn't normally do unless you... Uh, you don't want to risk your knees and your elbows. Right, all the fun and none of the scars, as we say. Okay, Kelly, show me how you play Skate or Die. Okay, this is the half pipe, which is... Um, regular skateboarding event and you do it to a combination that's a kick turn of joystick moves and button controls. There's no need to look at the documentation. Oh, you did that on purpose? Um, I wish. <laughs> uh, I'm going to try and get up in the air on this one. Up. All right. Ooh, oh. Beautiful. Almost. So it's a combination of joystick and, and, and the buttons. Correct. Oh, nice move. <laughs> However. So there are like 12 different moves you can do in here. Uh -huh. And you get points for the variety of your routine and you get bonus points at the end. So I got 8,000 points, which is a pretty good score. You can get up to 15,000 yeah. points in here. The crowd's 